Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's Amin with the Mind Heist podcast, episode 49. Uh, believe it or not, I just came from having lunch and I got spaghetti sauce on my white t shirt. <laughs> oh man. So, so I'm surprised you haven't gone for Mexican then. <laughs> Mexican. Um, the, the news I've got for you guys, like bad news and good news, right? So, bad news is, actually, to eat is not able to make it this episode he is flying to morocco as we, we discussed briefly in the last episode and uh so that's you know that's the bad news the good news is uh we've got a guest a a, a guest a fan um yeah uh, a, a mentee of mine <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's going to be a great conversation, inshallah. Hopefully, uh, you you would have seen by the title by now, like what we're going to talk about. I think it's going to be really good. Not, you know, we, we, I've kind of planned it a little bit. And so, yeah, so my guest today is Kaya. Um, he is, let me just, uh, what, what can I say about Kaya? So Kaya is, he's a Mind Heist listener, alhamdulillah, yeah. Danny. He's been guided to the correct path. Uh he loves coffee, but he's lactose intolerant, so I feel sorry for him on that. He's a fake Turk, also known as a Cypriot. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and, we'll get into uh, that. We'll get into that. And uh, uh, what else was I going to say about him? Yeah, he's an entrepreneur. He's an international speaker, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, pushing and, it. Yeah. Well. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> welcome, Kaya, to the Mind Heist podcast. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum to everybody listening. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. As you as you mentioned, I'm a fan of Mind Heist. Um, mm-hmm. I've been listening, I think, since um, episode one because I used to follow Ahi Tweet on on Twitter, even though I didn't mm. speak to him. I was made like a bit of a stalker because yeah. he was like the like the the crown prince of, of Muslim Twitter when it was like in its prime. And I, I wasn't really on there. Days. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't really active on it, but I used mm. to li- I used to follow people and. And keep up right but i never actually got involved in conversations but whenever he posted anything like the pure xi stuff or or, or mind heist i would just see it and yeah. jump on it and, and like this was when muslim content wasn't that you know as big as it was as big as it is today mm. so i not just jumped sophisticated. on it episode one yeah yeah not that mind heist is, isn't is unsophisticated but um yeah i jumped mm. on it early and um yeah alhamdulillah here we are episode, 49 mm. episodes later is it Mm, yeah, Jazakallah Khairan for your listenership. Yeah, and we actually, uh, I got to know Kaya through this podcast, isn't it? So that's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was it just a matter of, I think you emailed us, right? Um, <clears throat> you know what it was? Um, after a few episodes of listening, I, I realized that you are, uh, like me, um, you know, entrepreneurial, you've got your own business, similar business to mine as well, an agency, a marketing agency. And um, I just thought we had a few things in common. And because I'd listened to you for like, by that time, like seven hours of content, right? I yeah. quite quite weirdly kind of felt like a <laughs> closeness between you and myself and also between uh, Muhammad, because even though I'd followed him on Twitter for years, I'd never spoken mm. to him, right? Yeah. So, but I just, I thought, you know, uh, one of the episodes, you, you mentioned your Snapchat uh, at the end. Yeah. And you said, if anyone wants to you know, reach out, here's my Snapchat. So I just, I had Snapchat, so I thought, yeah, let me reach out to him. I did send yeah. an email before, I think, but nothing really, mm. I didn't get like a proper response from anybody. Um, mm. But yeah, the, the Snapchat, we just got talking on the Snapchat and um, yeah, that was it. That was like two years ago, which is crazy, maybe yeah. one and a half years ago. Mad. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I hope it's not been two years already. I don't know. Um, I'm thinking now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then we met up uh, when you were in town, basically. So yeah, I want to ask you, bro, before we go into yeah. the main topic, uh, because you've got your own podcast, of course. Um, mm mm-hmm what uh, you always ask people what is their favorite uh what do you call it caffeinated <laughs> beverage so i want to ask you <laughs> yeah. what's your favorite caffeinated beverage that's a good question bro. that's a very good question um right now it's um a coconut cappuccino simple coconut cappuccino because as you mentioned i'm, I'm lactose intolerant or lactose sensitive shall we say so mm. um yeah i go for the coconut milk cappuccino mm. goes down well bro okay. how about yourself mm. Uh, I'm pretty much same or same for the last few years. I am drinking Cortado whenever I go out. Okay. Uh, Cortado at home. I guess I make uh, I make uh, pretty much Cortado at home as well, but uh, a lot more quantity than what they would give you because Cortado is Spanish, right? It comes from uh, short. Uh, 
corto, I mm. guess Spanish is for short. So it's, I think it's always supposed to be in a smaller glass, but because I probably have, instead of one shot of uh, espresso, I'd probably have three or four. So I put a lot more milk and that becomes <laughs> okay. like a big quantity. Um, so maybe, yeah. Maybe you should try, and, before you move on, bro, you should probably try um, yeah. Moroccan coffee. I think it's a lot better than Algerian stuff. Algerian have. Moroccan coffee is really, really good. Bro. Algerian <laughs> coffee is not good anyway. I'm not not even going to pretend about that one. Uh, oh. Well, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, in Algeria, the coffee, the quality is not good. And the way it's made is very, it's like weak. It's not really espresso kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, not, I'm sure it's not, I don't really I'm enjoy sure it too stuff. much when I go there. Um, I would guess Morocco is similar, but whatever. Um, what about <laughs> <I doubt> it. <laughs> how does it feel to be a fake Turk bro <laughs> okay so for, for people listening um, I am Turkish Cypriot so um, my, my family's heritage is from Cyprus the Turkish side of Cyprus right so um, I don't feel I don't feel like I'm a fake Turk uh, definitely mm. a, a different kind of flavour of Turk mm. but uh, inshallah I'm, I'm authentic bro you know Ottoman, okay. Ottoman blood inshallah so you are Turkish, yeah? That's how you would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, yeah. yeah, I did divide as Turkish, yeah. Mm. I think most you know, like, if you came to the, let's say, random country, whatever, UAE, right? And somebody's asking you, where are you from? Do you just say Turkey to kind of cut to the chase? I say Turkish to make it yeah. truthful and, you know, not get into the, the, the details. If I think yeah. they might know of, of Cyprus and the Turkish side of Cyprus, if they, you know, if they if had a conversation with them about it before or something mm. similar like that they're aware of like the political situation i might go into it but otherwise i'll just say turkish and I'll leave it at that and usually that's good enough for them hmm okay interesting um okay just before we go into the topic today i just want to mention i finally put together a very very basic um web page or yeah it's a page it's, you can't call it a website for mind heist right um i just wanted to put, have a url where people can go if they want to ask anonymous question or um email us or what's the other thing I put on there something else right so if you're ever wondering like okay where's the Instagram link where's the anonymous questions link uh, just go to mindheistpodcast.com and now I've set up a page for that so uh, I just want to mention that before you know rather than mentioning it at the end basically so today we're talking about I don't know I guess it's the general topic of moving to a Muslim country, let's say, um, you're yeah, moving from a non-Muslim country, moving maybe from the West to a Muslim country. So, uh, like, as a precursor to that, bro, um, what would you say is, was your experience growing up when it comes to kind of getting out of your bubble of London, right? Because I think you, you grew up fully in London. So yeah. what um, what experiences did you have being exposed to the, you know, the world outside of just London? Yeah, that's a good question, bro. Um, to be honest, it was uh, when I was young. The me leaving my bubble, it was probably going from one bubble into another because every year we would go. Me and my family would go to Cyprus uh, once a yeah. year for about three weeks or so, and mm. sometimes we'd mix it up and go really crazy and go to Turkey instead. Right, so we, mm. we were just like those were the two places we went. That was the wow. the, the summer holiday, and then we'd mm. come back. And we would rarely, when I was a bit younger, we went to France, we went to Disneyland Paris when I was very very young. Uh, other than that, I don't think we've gone to any other foreign country with my as a family mm. anyway. Right. So we kind of went from one bubble to another. And in North London, where I live, it's pretty much quite Turkish anyway. Like a lot of yeah. secrets here anyway. So mm. I've always been in a very similar bubble up until I was about 18 when I started, uh, maybe maybe 19, when I first started writing for, uh, doing freelance blogging for mm. one publication. And uh, the, the, the same industry that I'm in now, sort of software and that kind of thing. And he had contacts in Europe, this, this guy that I worked for, and they had events, right? They had loads of events going on. So I got the opportunity to travel to Amsterdam, Paris again when I was a bit older, uh, and Switzerland a couple of times as well. So I got to travel to these mm. three places. That okay. was my first, uh, I, even went, I went, went to Scotland as well. Oh. So these, I started to, and then more recently I went to um, America last year, Miami, but that mm. was you know, after I'd already started traveling. Mm. I didn't yeah, know that's... actually that you had been to these places in Europe. When I said international speaker, I was just, I was thinking <laughs> yeah. of Miami. That's yeah, it. Yeah, no, I didn't, I, you... didn't speak in, I didn't speak in these places. I was just there as a journalist. I wasn't, oh. I wasn't the guy. What, what about in, in the US when you went? Yeah, on, on U, at the US, I, uh, I spoke on the Okay. Stage. Yeah, okay, that, that cool. wasn't a lie. <laughs> I did speak there. <laughs> but when I went to Europe, that was when I was like 18, 19. 
Uh, okay. I was going alongside this guy I was working for sometimes, and then oh. eventually he let me go by myself. Making his going, coffee and uh, stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I was still, I was, I was, I had some, I had some, you know, interesting tasks to do. I'm joking. It's mostly coffee making, but um, <laughs> yeah, it was cool. It was cool. We got to see, I got to see some, some different countries and different cultures mm. and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so, that, so, you know, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So growing up, you basically before you're 18, it was mostly uh, Turkey, London, Turkey, London. Yeah, yeah. Cyprus, Turkey, London, basically. Yeah. Have you even ever been like to, I don't know, like Birmingham, Milton Keynes, like anywhere like that outside of uh, London? Yeah, I have. Um, not as much as you'd, as you'd think. I've been to Hastings a couple of times. Uh, I've yeah. been to South End a few times. I've never so been you to just Birmingham. keep it to, South? Been, yeah, bro. Keep it. Listen, London's London, isn't it? Let's not get it twisted, yeah. man. I know, you're a, I know you're a bit of a Birmingham guy, but, <laughs> but London <laughs> is London. Really. Uh, okay. I've been to Leeds. I've been to Leeds. So I've been to a few different places, um, mm. but I don't spend too okay. much time outside of London. I'll mm. be honest. Okay, I'm just. I asked you that question because uh, because obviously you, you are gonna uh, leave the UK, move somewhere else. So I was wondering if there's any link sure. between like being kind of open and being um, aware of other countries and stuff, and being you know wanting to move and uh, not wanting but actually taking the actual leap uh, to move, um, like yeah. like. Do you think there's a link there? Do you think like you have an advantage because you were always going to Turkey or anything like that? I don't know. I think I think most people, especially in the last 10, 15 years where travel has become a bit more easy and a bit more accessible, most people travel, mm. you know, most people, even yeah. if, once, if once a year, if they're family, yeah. when they're growing up, you'll go to, you know, maybe to Algeria, or you'll go to wherever your parents are from mm. um, and you'll, you'll have that experience. So you will, I don't know if that's really what pushed me, the fact that we're going to these countries mm. um, every year because I don't think that's fruitively or hugely unique. Um, what I can say is that I always felt from around this age, 18, you know, 16, 17, 18, I started to feel that I didn't really like London as I got, as I, as I become more practicing, mm. which is around that time, I started mm. to feel, you know, some of the drawbacks of London. Um, mm. I didn't like, I also don't like London hugely from just like a dunya perspective anyway. Like I think it's a bit of an overrated uh, city. I might get a mm. bit of pushback on that, but that's to mm. one side. As I began, mm. as I began, you know, getting more practicing, I started seeing the 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 flaws in this in this place, and I started to think to myself, and I started to tell my family as well as, as far back as ten years ago, that I can't right. really see myself being here, you know, long term, mm. you know, being here forever. Okay. You know, I think one day one day I'd move somewhere. I didn't know where I'd move, but mm. I always had it back in my mind. And um, as I did travel more, you know, when I got married, um, we did travel to UAE. Uh, we travel to mm. travel to the Gulf countries, a few of them, UAE, mm. uh, Qatar, Kuwait. Uh, mm. So I got to see the Gulf, mm. the Gulf sort of lifestyle, the Gulf culture, and yeah, man, I just thought this is probably it. If, <laughs> if mm. it's not going to be London, then this is probably the mm. you know this is probably the best place I can go. Right. So you know, you said you, you don't really you didn't really like London too too much, and you were kind of thinking you would always move out at some time. Was that mm. like so? Is the motivation for you even today? Well, talk, tell me about then and now, right? Uh, is the motivation yeah. like fifty percent just quality of life and fifty percent for religious reasons, or like what's the proportion there before and then now? Um, good question. I, I, it's hard to put a percentage on it. Um, I mean, when I was growing up, I didn't really, I wasn't a huge fan of London, but I never thought to myself. Oh, it's so bad that I'll leave. It wasn't that kind of thing. Mm. I didn't hate. I don't hate London. I do love London. It's my home. My family lives mm. here. I'll never be mm. able to fully disconnect myself from London. So, really, it was only when the religious aspect come into play that I start to see that. You know, I start to ask myself when I have a family. You know, inshallah, uh, and I, I, you know, I start having several kids and, and sending send them to school as well. That's when it really starts getting real. When you get to that stage, am I comfortable here? And ten years ago, I was like iffy. I was like, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of going in a weird direction. I don't like the things that I see, you know, on, on the street and on TV and so on and so forth. And now mm. 10 years later on, or almost 10 years later on, um, mm. it's like definitely in my mind that this is not a place to raise children, mm. especially if you want to, you know, give them a good opportunity to, you know, be upon the right path and not get deviated and not, you know, a laugh a bit, like pulled into totally different directions of, of um, yeah. you know, you know what I mean? So, yeah, for me, it, it kind of just sort of that percentage of the religious aspect kind of grew a bit more as I got older mm. and as I sort of got closer towards, you know, having a family and getting married and that kind of good stuff. 
Um, mm. and I think now that is, inshallah, the main motivation. You know, and I, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make me of those who you know, want to move for his sake and not mm. for just dunya's sake or you know, just the, mm. you know, uh, the sake of luxury or the sake of mm. um, having, having a better quality of life. Although I do think that will come as a bonus, I don't want mm. that to be my main motivation. And that's something that I've mm. got to deal with, something that I've got to battle with myself, really, to make sure that my, my attention is correct. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so obviously you went to, you went to, you grew up going to Turkey, Cyprus, then later you went to different places, Europe, um, the Gulf, mm -hmm. anywhere else you've been, like especially Muslim countries? Yeah, um, been to Malaysia, which I know is a favorite of yours as well. Mm. Um, Malaysia was very, very nice. Um, where else have I been? As far as Muslim countries, I think that's it. I think just the Gulf countries, Turkey, Cyprus, Malaysia. Mm. Okay, yeah, so why, like, okay, out of those, like, were there any options, uh, like, serious options for you other than the UAE? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't rule out um, any of them, really, and I still, I still don't totally rule them out, you know. I, I so, like, like what were your, countries. like, top two or three, then? My top two, my top two was UAE and Qatar. Yeah. They were my top two because I like really? I like the um, the culture down there, mm. the, the, the laid you know the laid back culture of, of the Gulf. I like I mm. feel that I feel like I get that kind of vibe. I like the weather. I like the way that the cities are built and constructed. I like the, the modern infrastructure they're they're trying to get over there. Mm. So mm. I like I like the Gulf, right? Um, mm. Turkey is also an option. Malaysia was kind of a Malaysia never really crossed my mind because it was too far away for me personally. You know, I know right. for a fact, like I said before, I've got family in London, so I'm always going to be back and forth. You know, there's no right. way around that, and I, and I wouldn't want that to be mm. different anyway. I want to go see my mm. family. So I you're not even like, me. you're not even pretending that oh, I'm like disconnected. I'm going to go and that's my place, no. and I'm. Di you're not even no. lying to yourself, basically. You can't lie to yourself. <laughs> you can't lie to yourself, bro. Because yeah, you yeah. Can't, how, what am I going to cut my family? That would in, that would in, include cutting yeah. my family off. You know, cutting family ties. Yeah. Which can't obviously we know yeah. as Muslims yeah. you can't do that. So I mean, you know. some people might have some kind of dream of like. Uh, I don't know, like, oh, my parents could go with me or my parents mm. could, uh, let's say if you were going to move to Turkey, then you might be able to convince them to move, move to Turkey yeah. or, you know, something like that. Did you never really think of that? I did. And I still do to, to an extent, like, you know, I, I make dua that, you know, they do move to where I want to move, you know, and be, be with us over there in, in Dubai, inshallah. Mm. Um, but mm. at the same time, I know they, they may not, you know, it's realistic that realistically they, they probably won't. So yeah. you so, you just sort of have to deal with that, and and that's probably the main, the main um, obstacle to, to making that kind of move, uh, and wh really whether you move, you know, I said I said Malaysia is too far away, but really, you, you, even if you move to you know Amsterdam, you know it's not that far away. It's still far enough where you're not actually in contact with your family anymore. You're not living in the same town anymore. You can't pop down and see them, you know, twenty minute drive. That's no longer an option. So when you do move yeah. away like that, I think that's the main, that's the biggest. Um, issue they've got to to um, overcome yeah, yeah. It's, just one, it's just what it is man mm. it is what it is. I think I've got this I kind of would like to I would like to live in a place where like whoever whether it's siblings parents cousins like they can just come so it would need yeah. to be a place I don't know I would need to have maybe a big house like extra yeah. bedrooms uh, maybe the visa situation needs to be simple like that's what I would like, you know, to have that situation where anyone could come. Like even that would be so cool if my family from Algeria, even they could get into the country easily, like no visa issues. And it'll be like, yeah, just pay for the flight and then just come stay with me kind of thing. That would be yeah. quite sick. So that, that'd be that's interesting. Goal, that's I don't, goals, bro. That's goals, you know, that's, that's, uh, yeah. that's the dream, man, to have like... Yeah, you know, big big villa where there's enough there's enough rooms for mm. everybody to come and stay, and everyone's comfortable. Exactly, that's yeah. goals, bro. Yeah, inshallah, yeah. both of us can can attain that. Yeah, I don't know if see, I don't think that's really possible in UAE because obviously I don't own a house here, um, and if I wanted to own that kind of house here, you know, that's we're talking big box there, right? Um, mm -hmm. But then also the visa situation is a bit tricky. I think Algerians getting visas for UAE is a bit hit and miss i mean often they would get it but there is always a chance so you want a country with like very easy to get it kind of thing um like i think uh for example algerians get into turkey quite easily um yeah. so you know i don't know but i just i guess that's <coughs> not really an option here unless i strike gold or something 
You never know, bro. You never know. I want to see you be a bit more yeah. optimistic, bro. With that, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure you can uh, whip something up over the next uh, ten years. I think you gave me two years to get rich. Is it last year? You gave me two year deadline to get rich. Yeah. So I'm yeah. going to give you. I'm going to give you. I'll be a little bit more easy on you. I'll give you ten years to to get um, to get this villa, this like massive villa. Mm. Okay. I haven't reached, I haven't I reached I my need... goal. I haven't, I haven't got rich yet. So maybe you can hit mm. your goal. I mean. Definitely, uh, it's possible. I just uh, I think it would be difficult to justify spending that much when I know I can get something much cheaper elsewhere in in an in also in a good country kind of thing. So uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, let me get rich and then I'll get back to you on the decision. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, keep, keep me posted, bro. So, bro, I'm I'm interested, yeah, because I I don't think I've asked you this before, or I can't remember what you said. What what about Turkey, like? You're from Turkey. Uh, I don't think you have the passport, yeah. right? But you could get it. You don't need any visa. Turkey's maybe cheaper to live. Like, what? What's your thoughts about Turkey versus UAE? Yeah, it is a good question, and it's I, I thought about it as well. And again, I don't totally rule it out that one day I could I could live in Turkey. Um, hmm. But the reason I prefer UAE right now and for the foreseeable future uh, is because, firstly, if I was to get citizenship, um, I'd have to go. I either have to pay a big lump sum of money, which I don't know what that is, or I have to go through army, uh, six yeah. months of army. I think it's six months, yeah. um, mm. which is, you know, difficult to do when you know you've got your own business, you've got a family already. It can be difficult mm. to just put six months aside, and usually yeah. people do it when they're like seventeen, eighteen, so that they haven't got. But well, obviously, I was yeah. in that country at the time, so I didn't really do that. But yeah. yeah, that would be one obstacle, but probably not the biggest. The biggest issue. The biggest issue is just the fact that um, I. I I, I visited Istanbul many times. Istanbul is probably my Istanbul is my second favorite city in the world, right? So I love it. And if I was going to move to Turkey, it would be to Istanbul. Yeah. But whenever I go, I just can't see myself being there long term. It's just not. Mm. Uh, I like I like modern cities. I like um, right. you know good infrastructure. I like like forward thinking projects and this kind of thing. And as, mm. as great as Istanbul is, it's not really that kind of city. Istanbul is a historical city. It's a place where you go and see stuff and you can experience a very authentic culture of authentic food and drink and that kind of thing. And that's mm. amazing. But after I spend a week in Istanbul, mm. it starts to really great on me, bro. It starts to really mm. like, it's a very what busy city, you? very packed. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, the, the busyness, the busyness of it, um, mm. the infrastructure that need, that is in need of uh, updating because it's, a, mm. you know, it's, it's been there for thousands of years, obviously. Obviously, not all buildings are thousands of years, years old, but there is a big portion of the city where the buildings are very old and it's mm. very dated and mm. that kind of thing you know especially in like winter time it really it really just sort of you know grates on me and then you mix it with the the busyness of the place and you know yeah it just i can't see myself living there long term mm. that's in the main city i mean on the outskirts maybe you know there's some, there's yeah. some nice areas in the outskirts i wouldn't rule it out mm. but mm. um yeah but for then me, you get maybe less of the kind of urban feel yeah, and I do like and I do like living in a city. So yeah, it's it, I don't know. I don't rule it out, and I, I'm I wouldn't say that Turkey is a definite no or anything. But for me, yeah. it just doesn't scream. I can't see myself being in Turkey for like ten years and staying in Turkey and living there. It just doesn't yeah. seem. And on top of that, I think what we have discussed is it, this sort of split in Turkey, right? Without getting too political, um, there is a there is a very obvious and quite an even split, unfortunately, of like religious Turks, people who, who, who want, uh, you know, Islam to be dominant and, you know, to be um, what the country bases its laws off of, off of and bases its sort of society norms and culture and etiquettes off of, right? There's that, there's that um, 50% of people, very simplistic, yeah. call it 50%. The other half are, you know, they're, they're, they are Muslims and they will say that they're Muslims, but they, they want Islam and the state to be separated. They don't want yeah. Islam to be in the public view. Um, mm. They're, they're, they're people who hold um, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk in a very mm. high standing. And if you look at mm. his policies, again, I won't get too political. If you look at his policies and what he did when he came in, mm. It, mm. Um, he he um, you know he he stopped the adhan in in in, uh, in Arabic, for example. He stopped yeah. um, uh, uh, sisters wearing hijab in public only in or in, or, in, or in, sorry in universities and this kind of thing. So. The kind of policies that we, we look at France doing, right, and and sort of gasping at, Turkey was doing that about mm, yeah. you know, ninety years ago. Well, that's where and, we got uh, it from. Yeah, exactly. So, and um, that kind of mentality is still there in a lot of Turks. Yeah. Mind, and in, I say a lot because I can't put a number on it, but enough mm. to make it worrying. 
enough mm. to think, you know, I can't sit here too comfortably. Even though right now the situation is, is politically in the favour of the Muslims, or not the Muslims, mm. the, the, the people who want... Um, Islamically, Islamically inclined people, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah Islamically inclined uh, outwardly. Mm. Um, you, you can't say it's going to be like that way forever. Mm. And history proves that it won't be like that forever in Turkey mm. anyway. So I can't really sit there comfortably and say, yeah, this is somewhere again where, okay, I've left London for a more Islamic lifestyle. And Turkey will always be more Islamic than London, don't get me wrong. It is a Muslim country, of course it is. But there's always that sort of, you know, when I walk past people in the street, are they, are they you know, resenting the fact that my, my wife is in hijab, but they resent, resented the fact that I've got a beard, this kind of thing. Mm. And um, you, you, get that, you get that feeling sometimes, not all the time in Turkey, but you do get it sometimes. Mm. So I just can't, mm. I can't achieve that same sort of comfort that I, that I achieve in the Gulf. When I go to the Gulf, yeah. I just feel quite at home, to be honest, even though it's not my home, I'm not, I'm not Arab. Um, mm. I've, never, I've only spent, what, total of maybe two months in the Gulf in my life. Yeah. And yet when I go there, I just feel very at home. I don't feel judged in the slightest. I don't feel like my mm. wife is being judged in the slightest. Mm. Um, it just feels homely. It just feels like this is where we belong in that sense. And it, and it, it doesn't seem like it's going to change. So mm. That's a big statement. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Which part? Uh, you know, it feels like you belong there. It does. Yeah, it does. I don't really feel like I belong in London. Mm, I kind of feel really? like I, I kind of mm. feel like I belong. Yeah, I don't. I kind of feel like I belong in Turkey and Cyprus, but again, mm. I put what I just said aside, mm. I don't speak Turkish well enough to. Mm. I'm, I'm I'm very easily spotted as somebody who lives in London, right? They'll, I, they'll accept me as Turkish, but mm. I'm not really Turkish. You're like, oh, you're from London, right? You can barely put two words together, and I could improve that, of course. I could learn Turkish, but you'll mm. never you'll never hit that same. Um, mm. dialect, native sounding, that, native kind of, sounding yeah, slang you know, I mean, that. yeah, I mean, I know people who speak fluent Turkish, right? And they live in London. And I, as far as yeah. I'm concerned, they speak absolutely fantastic Turkish. The same was on TV. I can't differentiate mm. it. We go to Turkey yeah. or Cyprus, within 10 seconds, someone says, you're, you're not from here, are you? To that person who's speaking mm. fluent, that you're not from here, really? where are you from? You're from London. Because they, mm. they can understand that you haven't quite grasped that correct mm. dialect or whatever it may be. Interesting. So, yeah, you always get that kind of thing. And again, in the Gulf, the Gulf is built on people who aren't from there. So yeah, yeah, it's not a so not, it's, not the uh, building yeah. from there. It would be shocking if you were from there, isn't it? More yeah, than the opposite. exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I was going to ask you what mind heist is in Turkish, but maybe you don't know. <laughs> uh, let me think about that. I wouldn't know what heist is. Mind is uh, akal as well. The same as same as uh, Arabic. Akal is the same. Okay. But heist. That's way. That's beyond my pay grade, bro. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Have to get some Patreon money together then. <laughs> yeah, man. Sign up the Patreon so so Kai can get Turkish Turkish lessons. Yeah. Um. So so you uh, is it safe to say you like you want to move to the Gulf? Basically, for like to be closer to Allah, not to, close to Allah, but like to be able to practice your religion better or more freely, or is it to? meet other people who are practicing their religion like what is the ex beyond just saying islamic reasons mm. like what is the actual yeah, motivation yeah. yeah man um look i'm not going to pretend that i can't freely practice here i can freely mm. practice in london there's no yes i do sometimes when you've got to pray on the street when that time comes sometimes you feel a little bit apprehensive mm. uh, but generally speaking i've never had any issues um praying or anything like that i have had Interesting, I haven't told you about this offline, I'll tell you about it in a minute. Um, what could have been an Islamophobic um, incident, that was last week, I didn't tell you about it, I mean, but maybe mm. I'll get into it now. But generally speaking, um, I've, been, I've been a victim or, or attempted victim of crime as well in the past, but I haven't mm. really had that kind of situation. There are plenty of masajid around, you know, mm. don't, get that, don't get that twisted. I mean, London is not a bad place to be, to be mm. uh, practicing because there are facilities here. However, um, I've seen, and we have seen, again, through social media and through people who we know, um, the other direction that it can go in. Because, yes, those facilities are there if you want to use them, but you won't mm. be reminded to use them ever, ever. You know, okay. the mosques, the, most of the mosques here are not um, prominently um, shown. There's no Adhan five times a day. Um, there's no, you know, people in the street giving, you know, just sort of reminding you based on their dress, or maybe there isn't some parts of London. But you know what I mean? There's no, you have to sort of go out of your way here to, to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. 
when you're in the Gulf or you're in a, another Muslim country, these are reminders are everywhere, you know. I mm. mean, you walk in, in the malls, you know, Dubai Mall, and, you know, you, you have, um, we have this, we have this um, conception that Dubai is very, the, the Las Vegas of the Middle East, right? But if you walk in, in Dubai Mall during Salah time, then the Adhan is mm. going off in the mall, and the screens that are usually showing advertisements or whatever, they're turned off and it's got the little mosque sign. And it's like you go, there's a mosque inside, there's many mosques inside the mall, and you go and it's full. That's what really yeah. shocks me, the fact that you go to the mosque and the mosque is full. It's a, mm. in the, the mosque is like, you know, decently sized room, mm. and it's full. And all of the masajid in the, in, in the Dubai Mall is full. And you just think, wow, this is like the center of what's supposed to be the commercial Las Vegas, whatever you want to call it. But when it's mm. time for Salah, the, the culture here is you go and pray, you know, to the point mm. where the many mosques they have get full. So mm. you don't get that in London, you know. If I go mm. and pray, um, you know, Asr later, Asr later on in, in, in Jamaat, then it's going to be like two, two rows. And uh, it's the same for, across London because, and it's mostly going to be old people, by the way. Very, mm. very rarely going to get young people in there. Yeah. So this kind of, you know, there's a definite distinction between um, being free to do it and being mm. constantly reminded to do it and being mm. around people who are doing it. An environment and, where um, you're kind of encouraged to do it, yeah. Yeah, encouraged to do it. And I'm, I'm not even talking about myself, really, because, you know, alhamdulillah, I've been, I've been practicing for, for a few years now. So it's not like I'm, I'm just sort of trying to practice and I need encouragement. We all need encouragement. I need encouragement through the day I die. And I'll need, um, you know, Allah's guidance through the day I die. I'll, I'll ask Allah to make my heart firm upon his religion. But I think about it from my children's perspective, where mm. they're coming into this dunya fresh, right? They need, I didn't really get this growing up where I had, you know, encouragement to practice or encouragement. It was all from Allah. I need to make sure, you know, to the best of my ability, that my children are in a place, inshallah, where they will get that encouragement. They will be in that environment where um, they don't have to go out of their way or go against society to practice. It's just, mm. it's actually in line with the culture of the place you're in to practice. And if anything, you're going against the culture, against the etiquette mm. of the people to not practice. Mm. I think that will just make it a lot, a lot easier to, to be a practicing Muslim. And um, yeah. that's the main motivation, man. Mm. You know, uh, what surprised me in Turkey is how few people go to the Masjid for Jama'a. Like, it seems to be almost like in their mind, uh, okay, it's time for Asr. <coughs> Whether I pray um, at home or in the mosque, it's identical. Like, mm. they're not, don't seem to be don't seem to really find any extra benefit or reward in going to the masjid. I don't know if that's to do with uh, fiqh reasons or just uh, some kind of culture. I don't know what it is, but it's kind of weird, man, because mm. I went to, um, I was uh, walking across like, you know, the Bosphorus. Um, I was a little bit like uh, in the north side of Istanbul, yeah, uh, next to the mm. Bosphorus, walking up that kind of uh, corniche, whatever you call it, yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was Asr time. It was, yeah, it was definitely Asr. And I go to a random masjid, and bro, there were five people. There were yeah. five people in a masjid. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. yo, the imam proper, afterwards. The a imam comes. Draw, right? It was proper masjid, yeah. yeah. Uh, probably a few hundred years old. And mm -hmm. the imam, because there's so few of us, he can come and shake hands with everyone that was there because only five <laughs> people. So uh, I was quite surprised with that. Um, in, in the UAE, like, by the way, in UAE, all the masajid, you generally find two, three rows as well, right? Uh, very rarely is it full because most of the time it's designed. Obviously, you've got to design the masjid with Jummah in mind, right? So you've got to fill everyone in yeah, for Jummah. Um, I think maybe here we, we have 10, 20 percent more people in the masjid than in the UK. Um, I think in Dubai, more probably people are praying there more because they're they're tourists, they're chilling, they're not at work. But definitely in the UAE, there's kind of a culture where, I mean, by law, yeah, technically by law, you must give people uh, a break to pray. Okay, so maybe most people don't take advantage of it. They're not that bothered. There's, you know, you always know that in when you're at work, you technically have this and this right, but there's a pressure not to really take those rights, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of happens. Um, but technically, you have the right to, to stop your work and go and pray. Um, and you do get people who are leaving their office and they actually go to pray, whether it's in a prayer room or in an actual masjid. So you do have that culture for sure. Um, at the same time, you know, we do still, we don't, we don't pack the masjid. Um, but maybe we would never pack the masjid anyway because they're designed for Jumu'ah sizes, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, of course. So, so to summarize, like your reason for coming here is you just want to be like in an environment where it's like easy uh, to remember to to do certain things. It's easy to raise your kids thinking a certain way, and you know it's kind of very obvious reasons, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Pretty much. Anything more specific, like I want to learn Arabic or and anything. Yeah. Again, this is, I don't want to be, I don't want to be those, those kind of people who say, oh, once I move, I'm going to learn Arabic. And I mean, again, I could learn Arabic here, right? My Arabic yeah. isn't, isn't, isn't good. I could learn mm. it here. I don't want to be making excuses that, I, oh, there's no lessons here. I could go and study here. Mm. But um, again, that's a shortcoming that I have, right? That perhaps, inshallah, will be rectified when I do go to a country where there's Arabic all over the place on the signs. Maybe people don't speak it as often as they speak English, but it will be, mm. it will be there, especially when I visit any government office. Um, when I deal with any government, they'll send me Arabic you know, papers probably. And mm. you know, there are probably just as many, if not more lessons there than there are here. So maybe there'll be more times, maybe more different days. I can go nighttime, daytime, morning time um, to, for me to make it even easier for me to go and learn Arabic. So that's obviously one motivation, learning Arabic, um, Get, uh, learning knowledge in general, just going and, and, and sitting with, with students of knowledge and trying to learn from them. Um, so yeah, that's another that's another motivation. Just to, because like I said, it's not just it is for me to get these um, these reminders, but it's also my children again, right? To get these sort of these reminders of of you know, what you should be doing in life and not not just sort of living day to day and you know the London lifestyle, the sort of rat race. Um, I want I want more of those reminders to be there. So for myself and for my and for my family. Learning Arabic and mm. learning knowledge is just not one more of those reminders, basically. Mm. Anything else specific that you're hoping to get out of it? To get out of it? I mean... Bro, let's be real. You want to go to those fancy cafes, bro. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. If you want to talk about dunya perspective, like I said, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm leaving it open. Like, we went yeah. down the Islamic route, but yeah. whatever. I, mean, I want to know like your motivations, said, basically. Yeah, like I said, man, um, I ask Allah to make my intention purely for his sake. But um, like I said before, London isn't hugely attractive to me dunya-wise. Dubai is. I do like Dubai. That is the bonus there. That um, it's, you know, even if we're talking about um, kind of kind of moving away from um, Islamic reasons, and, but not towards totally dunya reasons, there's crime. The, the lack of crime is, is far, far, far less. Almost zero crime mm -hmm. in Dubai compared to London anyway. Yeah. Um, the the sexualization hyper sexualization of of the culture here in London uh, is not there mm. and it's getting worse uh, in London so those two things are, are other big drivers for me that they're, they're not they're not things I'm trying to attain they're trying they're things I'm trying to avoid so I, I feel like by moving inshallah I can avoid those uh, a bit more you know Dubai is not some sort of paradise where you're not going to get you know fitna of any any sort it's not paradise so you you'll get you'll get sort of drawbacks as well. But compared to London, it will definitely be a massive, massive step forward. Mm. Um, in terms of just like, go on. No, go on. In terms of just like dunya, um, yeah, I, I like a, I like a good coffee, man. I like a nice coffee shop. But again, you can get that here. But it's just Dubai is just more accessible, man. Dubai is it's a smaller place compared to London. It's a lot more easy to get from one end to the other. You can go and you know, you can go to sort of nice areas um, very, very quickly, very easily, and, and go home again. In London, you need, you need like an hour on a train, or where I live anyway, an hour on a train just to get to central London, an hour back. And it's not the nicest of journeys, you know. And, you know, the weather's not that, you know, weather's very different over there, um, in my, of my opinion, anyway, not much nicer. Mm. So, yeah, the lifestyle is, is better as well, in my, in my opinion. Uh, you get better restaurants over there, if you're talking about purely mm. dunya perspective. You get all the mm. best restaurants from, like, um, everywhere, the States and Australia and everywhere else that they are. You get them over there, the kind of stuff that you don't get here. Mm. So, all halal. And all halal as well, you know, without even asking, mm. oh, we've got to check mm. the menu, is it going to be this or that? No, nothing yeah. nothing like that. You just walk in and just enjoy it and, and go out. And then mm. you walk outside, you hear the adhan, you go and pray. Mm. What's not to like, man? You know, I compare mm. it to London, I just think. I sometimes wonder, mm. you know, why anybody would, obviously, you know, it's not, it's not always easy to sort of move, move places, mm. but... If you had the opportunity, if you had the, if you had the, um, yeah, if you had the opportunity to move, I do wonder yeah. why anybody wouldn't want to move from London, to be honest. And I'm not just saying mm. Dubai. It could I'll, be anywhere. We'll get into that, inshallah. You know, yeah. just speaking of um, speaking of weather, yeah, I I was looking the other day at uh, the weather in uh, Turkey compared to 
uh, the UK, right? I was just kind of curious and stuff. And it turns out the weather, at least in Istanbul, yeah, the weather in Istanbul in the winter is more is harsher than in the UK, subhanAllah. Like uh, bro, more having, rainfall. He's, he's telling me you're having connectivity issues, bro. Yeah, I am having connectivity issues. Let me just turn my camera off. Um, yes, so if you, uh, yeah, this, you can hear me fine, yeah? Maybe you can't hear me fine. Start a question again, we'll go again, bro. Yeah, yeah, so uh, I was saying about the weather. The weather in uh, Istanbul, yeah, I was looking at it. I was comparing Istanbul to London or Birmingham or somewhere like that. Yeah. And it turns out the weather in the winter in Istanbul is harsher than in the UK. Yeah. So um, I can't remember if it was colder or not, but definitely more rainfall and mm -hmm. uh, less sunny days or, you know, more cloudy days, basically. Yeah. Um, and also so, a lot more snow. Yeah. You can get a lot of snow in, uh, yes. in Istanbul in the winter. Yes. And um, yeah, a lot more rainfall. And also don't forget... Um, earthquake the, uh, the threat of an earthquake i think oh, once, yes. every, once every was it 10 20 years it's due an earthquake mm. and it's yes. and, you know may allah protect all the muslims yeah it, it is due mm. it is due uh, mm. to have an earthquake so it's, a, yeah. it's one of them months man it's a little bit iffy on, mm. on, the, on when, when i was there 2011 when i was there then uh i i went like with my uni and the, we were talking about basically someone who works there they were talking about how a, an earthquake is actually due yeah uh, i think it's supposed to be it's it's uh, one of the big ones like every 50 years or 100 yeah. years or something and this one it would be something like six seven or eight magnitude and they estimate that like i think it was like five hundred thousand people would die from that yeah. because yeah. a lot of the city is old and it's not designed to withstand it yeah so that's true. That's crazy, man. Um, he is crazy. Uh, what was I gonna ask you about um, about the UAE? So yes, that was it. So okay, bro, you said I don't know how, I, I don't know why people wouldn't like want to live here or at least leave the UK or whatever. Yeah, um, I think there are usually two main reasons. Yeah, that people don't make yeah. that jump, even if they want to. Right, I'm talking about the people that want to. Yeah, and I don't yeah. think a lot of people. You know, a lot of people are open to it, but there are two reasons they don't. Number one is work, right? Finding work, um, yeah. work that pays the same amount or just the ability to work, basically finding a job. Secondly is um, family, like having parents that are in the UK and your parents are not going to leave and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so like, do you think you're in some kind of like how, basically how are you dealing with those two things? Yeah. Well, firstly, the more important one, which is family. Um, I mentioned it before. Um, can, you still, can you still hear me? Yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I mentioned it before that um, it's going to be hard, you know, leaving family behind, uh, so to speak, is difficult. And it, that's going to be the main, you know, problem that, that me and my wife have when we move. It's going to be that we miss our family and we're not able to sort of see them very regularly. And um, all we can do really is invite them over and, and hope they visit. And, and we visit them every few, every few months, you know. Um, mm. That's pretty What do you much mean by every few months? Um, I mean, we plan, you know, maybe every three, four months to, to, to go back to the UK for a little bit and, and see. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I mean, at least for the first year anyway. I, mean, I, I yeah. don't know if I can do that for like forever. Mm. But for the first year, I think just to ease, you know, ease the process a little bit uh, mm. every, you know, three, four months. I mean, maybe that's a little bit ambitious, but um, mm. that's, which we, we plan to do something like that. Or we can meet them halfway in Turkey, for example, or in Cyprus on a holiday, yeah. something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the fact is you're not going to have them there all the time or every day you can't just sort of pop and see them you can call them um there's ways to call them <laughs> mm. so yeah i mean it, it's di there's no real easy answer to that because it is going to be difficult that is, that is the main issue right but mm. um one of our one of our mutual friends uh, i won't i won't name him in case he doesn't want to be named but one of our mutual friends uh last time we were in uh, dubai together mm. he said something interesting to me and he said um when i when i told him that i was planning to move he was like um I can't remember how he phrased it, but he said, yeah, some, somebody in your family has got to take, the, it's got to be somebody in your family has got to take the plunge. And what I think he meant by that is, you know, your, your parents obviously went and lived there. My parents, mm. my parents, sorry, went, went and oh, they were born there, actually, my grandparents that came over from Cyprus. Mm. My parents stayed and lived. And if I don't take the plunge at this point mm. where 
I can see um, you know UK society going in a certain direction, like I said before, mm. crime wise, uh, hypersexualization wise, and all the other stuff. Yeah. If I don't take the plunge now, will my children take the plunge, or will it be too late for mm. my children to take the plunge? You know, yeah. are they going to have? Are they going to be in that p- position? Will they have the same opportunity as me to take mm. the plunge? Even you know, will they have that um, you know opportunity? So yeah, he is basically saying yeah, if you don't take it, maybe nobody else will take it, and then you might be lost to you know your, your family. You know, Allah forbid, maybe lost to a different culture, a different society, and that can that can pull you away from the deen, as we as we see, it does happen. Mm. So that was a very interesting yeah. thing. As far as um, as far as um, how I'm doing it, like job wise, as you mentioned, I, I run my own business, so that mm. does make it a little bit easier. Uh, it's not it's not exactly a smooth, you know, the smoothest of processes, but mm. if you do own a business, you can you can make that move, and you don't need to be employed by somebody else. So mm. that's how we're going to do it, inshallah, moving my business there. Mm. So and you're actually moving your business, yeah? Yeah, the business is going to be moved over there. And that's mm. the way, that's the only way, really, you can, unless you are employed by somebody yeah. else, you have mm. to move the business there, set the business up there. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's obviously, for people that don't know, that's, so of course you can uh, have a visa, so you're allowed to live yes. there. And yes. I guess there's the bonus of the whole tax thing as well. Yeah, and, and you know, obviously there's no income tax in the UAE, um, and there is plenty of tax here in the UK, so that's another another bonus of, of moving there. There are other yeah. fees involved. It's not totally free. You have mm. a lot of um, setup fees to, to actually get yeah. the business uh, set up and running, which you don't yeah. have here. So it's kind of like a trade-off of like a flat setup fee with no taxes, whereas in London it's like, yeah, you can start a business with, with very low fees, but yeah. whatever you make, we're going to take a big chunk out of it. Yeah, so yeah. there's a trade-off. I mean, here. it's kind of like the uh, it's the difference between VAT and income tax, right? So VAT, yeah. it's like if let's say VAT is whatever twenty uh, percent, like in the mm. UK. Yeah, if you get if you increase your income, that ten percent, uh, that twenty percent doesn't change. It's still twenty percent. Yeah. Right. So you can actually make that twenty percent less and less significant amount to you by earning more. But if you have income tax, it's like you, you can never run away from it. It's, it's exactly. always following you, basically. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so, so just like here, you might spend £5,000 a year on set, you know, your business registration, but then you're not just simply not going to pay anything else, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's you would hope fee. that you would grow your business to a level where £5,000 is insignificant. Inshallah, inshallah. That's, that's the aim. That's the goal. And you know, mm. if, and it, but you know, if it if it wasn't the case, and if it was the taxes were still exactly the same as the UK, I'd still mm. I'd still say it's like a, a no brainer, really, um, really? To, to make the move. Yeah, man. I mean, mm. finance finances aside, this isn't really about you know. I, I keep saying you know, making your intention pure is a very difficult thing, um, but you know, for the financial um, benefits aside, mm. if, if the tax situation, the money situation is exactly the same, it's still it's still the right decision because of all the stuff I mentioned before. Right. Okay. So I was going to ask you, actually, one of the questions I had is like, okay, at what point, like at what percent of income tax would you start <laughs> questioning UAE? I wouldn't, bro. I, I wouldn't. If it got to the same stage as UK, then yeah. now it's like, okay, all, you know, quote unquote, all I have now is just the the the, the immense benefits of, having, of living in an Islamic society with the same mm. income that I would have in UK. Still, mm. it's still again, like I said, a no-brainer to make that move. So, the but wouldn't that you, you consider other Muslim countries? Um, yeah, that would obviously um, one one advantage of the UAE would be you know struck off because that would yeah. you know, the tax situation would be the same. So that's for sure. But again, it wouldn't necessarily. It would, all it would do is bring it on par with everywhere everywhere else. So, you know, uh, like I mentioned previously. Mm. I like the the culture and the the, the laid back nature and the the structure, the infrastructure of of the Gulf. So, uh, yeah, I, I like it, man. I, I haven't really come across mm. anywhere else where I could say I could live there for a long time mm. the same way so that I, would, could, I look at the Gulf. It would take quite a lot of income tax <laughs> for you to <laughs> yeah. look elsewhere. Yeah, right. basically. yeah. Once it, once mm. I go past like the the, the sixty percent mark, I think I'd start questioning. <laughs> it. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. okay, I remember there was I can't one of these. Uh, some famous French actor, I think mm. he's one of the kind of old school ones. He famously, um, he he famously left France. Like he 
what's the word? He got rid of his passport. Oh, yeah. Um, Burn so his passport. That, yeah, and he was offered or he took up a Russian passport. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was like because of taxes. Like in France, he was paying 50% or something. And in Russia, it's like fixed 17% for everyone, no okay. matter how much you earn. So I think okay. it was like a bit of a symbolic thing, like a, a thing of defiance. Like mm-hmm. you guys are just ridiculous, like 50%. Yeah. Like, it's, that, is, that is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I think... Um, I think once you get to a certain bracket in the UK, it hits 40%, if I'm not mistaken. Could, could yeah, be mistaken, I, I, yeah, I thought actually it goes up to 50, but maybe it's 45%. Something yeah, like I think that. it could be 45, actually, which yeah. is which still is crazy, you know. Yeah. Um, I think that's so, beyond, like, once you get beyond 120 or something. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can make the argument that that's a lot of money that you're making, but 40% of anything, 45% of anything, you know, whatever you're yeah. making, that's just crazy. I mean, uh, I think that really gets into territory of oppression at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, I agree with you. Um, and depends especially, on your kind of philosophy, but yeah. I mean, yeah. when you see the state of our roads in the UK, bro, <laughs> I'll, I'll say it's oppression, trust me. Paying yeah, that much tax. And, yeah, you, yeah, you're crying. <laughs> um, so you, you called it an Islamic society. Like, would you actually describe it that way? Are you still not sure if you would actually describe it that way? Like, what's People your like, thoughts on in the, in the UAE, that is? I mean, look, it's a, it's a Muslim country. It's, I want, uh, Islamic, yeah. so, Islamic society, you know, there'll mm. be def- different because definitions. I, when you said that word, I started getting this utopian <laughs> vision. Yeah, yeah. I, can, I, I can imagine you sort of having, you know, pushing me back on that one. But um, oh. yeah, it's, it's definitely a Muslim country. That's, what, that's the correct term for it, right? Correct label. Because Islamic society, mm. you're right, it's got this utopian um, connotation. And like I mentioned earlier as well, Dubai and UAE and nowhere on earth, even even you know Saudi and elsewhere, they're not you know paradise, right? There's going to be mm. always be issues, places where people mm. are falling short. Fitna mm. is, is occurring. Mm. You know, if you think you can find somewhere on earth where it doesn't happen, then you're, you're dreaming, right? So that's not mm. really the the goal here to find some sort of perfect Islamic utopia. Mm. Even though I think you guys discussed that on the previous episode. Mm. Um, the, the the point is, it's a Muslim country, and there are many Muslim yeah. countries. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. You know, the Adhan is there five times a day and all the stuff I mentioned mm. before, the, the etiquettes, the culture, the fact that it's just more easy to be a Muslim than it is to be a non-Muslim pretty much. You know, the, mm. the, the, the things that happen in Ramadan to make sure that, you know, everyone's fasting or, or at least, you know, respecting the, the fasting hours. All this kind of thing, you know, it, it equates to just being a Muslim uh, country, uh, an Islamically inclined society at the very least. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, man, and I, I think... Um, you know, going back to the this idea that you know Dubai or UAE or even the Gulf countries in general now, because I think that this sort of this reputation is now seeping out of UAE into the rest of the Gulf. That mm. you know, it's sort of like it's more about luxury and consumerism and and money rather than anything else. And there is that aspect of it. Let's not get mm. it twisted. I mean, these places are tourism hotspots and they're they're the commercial hotspots, they're business hubs. So there's definitely that element there of, you know, people mm. looking to make money and looking to live a, a luxury lifestyle for the, for mm. the rich and famous. That definitely exists. Mm. But for the everyday person... Like yourself. <laughs> no, no, definitely not me. But for the everyday well, person... Bro, you're, like, an, you're an international speaker, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm going to put this on my CV, by the way, the fact that we're having this... Uh, you're in UAE right now and I'm in the UK. I'm going to put down UAE, speaking in UAE, on my, on yes. my CV. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what was I saying? Um... What was I saying? Yeah, you're saying there is the aspect of a consumerism. Yeah, assessment. that's right. There is that aspect of it, right? Um, yeah. But it does get blown out of proportion. And you can, the everyday person like me, like you, mm. you can live a very Islamic lifestyle there. Like I said, with all the, these facilities and these, um, you know, concessions almost, not concessions, but, you know, these, the, you know the facilities is a good way to put it, that are there. And, um, mm. yeah, it, it just it allows you to live that lifestyle if you want to. And if you want to seek out fitna, then you don't have to go. I don't have to go to Dubai to seek out that kind of fit. No, I'm in London. Yeah, let's not forget. Mm. Let's not forget where I am now, right? I mean, mm. and you do. You do often hear these. Um, I have heard these arguments from from people who live uh, in in Western societies, and they're like, "Oh, Dubai is this, Dubai is that." It's like, bro, do you know where you live right now? Like, this is this is as far mm. more fitna here. It's the fact mm. that you don't see it every day because you, you're not looking for it, right? And the same in Dubai. Mm. If you're not looking for that kind of thing, you won't see it. You know, if you don't go mm. to the certain areas at certain times, you won't see that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you just you, you live the, you live a, 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 an Islamic life, and it's just a lot easier to do it there than it mm. is here. And any fitna that you think Dubai has, if you're living in any Western country, 
trust me, you, you've got it worse where you are. So mm. that's my that's my yeah, mm. feelings on the subject. I think everyone knows, right? I, I kind of I lean towards encouraging people to live in Muslim countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I must I must admit, I sometimes struggle with this this kind of whole discourse, right? Because in the UAE, I think definitely, or not just UAE, but any Muslim country. Well, let's talk about UAE. Yeah, like you said, if you want to live this lifestyle, like <coughs> try to you know be committed to Islam and you know family kind of life and everything. You can do it, you know, yeah. definitely. Even within Dubai, you can live in specific areas. You can only go to specific areas. And, you know, you kind of you kind of pick your areas where you want to go and who you want to mix with. And that yeah. will influence, uh, you know, the life you live, basically. And the good and the bad influences kind of up to you. Yeah. Um, however, if we're comparing London Islamic or Muslim community with Dubai Muslim community... I often feel like the not in every aspect but certain aspects like in London if you live in certain areas of London it's like there's Muslims everywhere there's you know people dressing you know quote unquote uh, Muslim way um, yeah. there's there's a uh, masajid like all over the place there's uh, halaqat there's uh, lessons to attend there's events there's so a lot more than UAE or, or mm -hmm. Dubai let's say and so they that's sometimes what the fuel people use to argue this whole thing of uh london's more islamic than dubai yeah what would um, you say to that it's an interesting one because you're right if you go to certain parts of like east london or west london you get this very you get this feeling where it's like wow am i in a muslim country yeah um but here's the thing you're not right and even if mm. it's like majority you know, even if it's like um um highly populated muslim area you, you, if you walk the streets for about an hour, you'll be very mm. quickly reminded that this isn't a Muslim society, right? True. And if you walk into a shop in London, mm. I walk to a shop in Dubai and I, and I, and, or, or wherever I'm going in Dubai, and I say, mm. oh, I see a taxi driver, and I give him salams, you know, and, and he's going to respond to me. Mm. You know, they may not, yeah. they're not all Muslim there. You know, there's a lot of people in Dubai who are not Muslim, but the vast mm. majority, majority are. Yeah. And you have that sort of, you know, feeling that just everyone around you is a Muslim, even those who are, who are not dressed in a certain, in a certain way. Yeah. So you get that sort of feeling that, you know what, everyone here is my brother and my sister, or, mm. you know, or, or there's like, you know, 10, 20% who aren't, but that's fine. Mm. And then it's like, you, you really do feel that that kind of, um, you don't have to go to a certain area to feel that. And mm. yeah, you just get that feeling of, I can give salams to everyone here and be pretty confident that I'm going to get a return back or they, under, or they even understand what I'm saying. You know, mm. if I walk into you know, most shops or restaurants in, in London, um, the first thing I'm asking them is, is it halal in here or not? You know, or not? Not I'm yeah. not going to. I'm not looking to give them. You know, I'm not going to give them salams or anything like that, because they're not Muslim. Um, so, you know, it's you, you get that. I'm not saying, and I'm not saying that London is totally bad. You know, uh, it's true that you can go to certain areas and feel very, very at home. Feel mm. very. Uh, you get a brotherly and sisterly vibe. You know, you go yeah. to the to the masjid on the Friday and it's packed. You know, mashallah, mm. the our masjid are packed on Fridays you know, in London, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Um, you know, and for Eid, you can go to uh, Eid in the park mm. and have like a massive Eid, and that's great. So you get obviously you get these like big, you know, Islamic gatherings and and and, and uh, lessons and eye socks doing things, all this kind of stuff. It's great, man. Yeah. But then you walk outside the street and it's just like you realize you're just what are we in, in the UK? It's two, two, three percent Muslim, or is it five percent these mm. days? And you feel mm. it, bro. And there's no way around that, you know. And you feel mm. that. Yeah, I mean, oh, I'm in Whitechapel today. I can, feel, I can see all the Muslims. But then you go, mm. you know, you walk three streets past Whitechapel and it's back to normal again, you know? And, yes. and, and, and it's not, and that's not to say that, oh, you know, ugh, I'm living amongst, I'm living amongst the disbelievers and, you know, I can't mm. stand it. I'm just saying, like, you don't, you don't get that same vibe, that same mm. sort of um, Islamic vibe everywhere. You have to go to certain nooks and crannies of the, of the city and that's yeah. it. And unless you're going to live there and stay there and never leave there, yeah. you're not going to get that all the time and you're, and you're always mm. going to be re re reminded of you know mm. the fact that you're a minority when you look at social media when you look at the news when you look at the kind of things that are being said said about you by politicians you know the prime minister of the uk right now we know what he's been saying about um sisters wearing the carb in the past so you know it's a constant reminder that you know yes we're here we've got a decent population here alhamdulillah but it's not really 
you know, it's not really that welcoming to us. It's not really mm. that accommodating to us. They're just, they're being tolerant, not accommodating, you know, to a certain extent. Mm. And that's not, to, yeah. that's not to tie them all with the same brush. That there's plenty of people here in the UK who are non-Muslims and they're fantastic people uh, in the sense that they are accommodating to the Muslims and they, they want to be friendly with the Muslims and they want to, they want to help the Muslims and they want to help them be you know, comfortable and, and, and uh, live a good life here. Mm. I'm not denying those kind of people exist in that sense. But um, it's a minority again. And mm. for me, I just, can't, I just can't feel totally at home here in that sense. And maybe that's different for other people. You know, I'm not saying that my way is, it's got to be my way or the highway. Maybe mm. other people feel fantastically at home here and they're very happy in their community and they want to keep living like that and they, and they think their children have got, you know, good Islamic school to go to, the masjid is down the street, it's all set up for them. Maybe, you know, mm. may Allah put barakah in, 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 in that decision they're making to stay here and be in that community. Mm. And um, it can work, you know, I'm not saying it can't work. But for me personally, I just, yeah, everything put together, I just, it doesn't quite add up to me to, to, to put down roots here rather than somewhere where it's a bit more Islamic. So, so the way that you're talking now, it's kind of like it's completely up to each person. So you wouldn't say that there's a blanket encouragement to go to a Muslim country? For me, for me, it's, for me it's a no-brainer. This is what I'm saying. For me, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, for yeah. You, but what about in general? In general, again, I, I'd still... Uh, my well, you're saying there is no general? Well, no. In general, my, my general advice is, to, is to, to move to a Muslim country. That is my general yeah. advice. But okay. realistically, I know that most people can't or a lot of people can't because, again... <clears throat> job situation, yeah. uh, maybe they've got um, family situation where they can't just leave like that. Certain things, right? Um, mm. So that's, that's being realistic. Um, but oh. generally speaking, my general advice, especially when you look at, um, again, crime and the, the hypersexualization of society and all the other things that go along with it, mm. um, I know for a fact it's got worse in the last 10 years of my life because I remember looking back when I was 18 and thinking, oh, things are, things are going down dodgy path right and now yeah. and now we're on the dodgy path we're actually on it like the things that we used to say that oh pretty soon they're going to be teaching su such mm. and such in schools are going to be or this is going to be so common or mm. or you know social media is going to look like this it's, it's now we're here we're actually here yeah. now this isn't yeah. a theory anymore this isn't a fear we're actually mm. here and so i look in 10 years time from today you know in 10 in, in 2030 what mm. is it going to look like and that's when my child my, that's when my children inshallah are going to be growing up you know 2030 2040 mm that's when they're going to be teenagers, inshallah, or, or, or you know, Allah knows best how old they're going to be. But, you know, I've got to think about this kind of stuff. You know, I think when you, when you do get married and start thinking about children, you do have to think about beyond just your comfort and, you know, your, the, yes. the, um, the, the, the um, how can I put it? You may look at yourself and think that you can handle this. Yeah. Like, oh, I can handle living here. I, I've, I've been a Muslim for 20, 30, 50 years. I'm fine here. But what about, what about your children, though? What about their children? Mm. You know, I think one of the worst things about living as a minority or even if you're the majority, but you're kind of you're not in any position of authority in a country mm -hmm. is having an inferiority complex that yeah. for me, that's like one of the biggest downsides of living somewhere like the UK, where it's like, OK, in your little neighborhood, you might be top dog. You know, you might have Muslims everywhere, masajid, uh, Islamic schools, and you kind of live in your bubble. Uh, mm -hmm. But whenever you interact with the world outside of that bubble, you're, you know, you're low kind of thing. And people have to, they, they see it as a burden to be accommodating for you. And yeah. you're the weirdo. And kids growing up like that with that kind of feeling that, oh, we're a burden on society. They don't mm -hmm. want us here, but they're just kind of, you know, making it work because we're here and it's too late kind of thing. Yeah. That's like, I think one of the worst things, um, one of the worst things. Yeah. Um, Having said that, you know, I just wanted to add this anecdote. Yeah, a friend of mine, he said his son, uh, he was still, I can't remember how it came up, but his son who's, uh, I think he's like uh, eight years old or something. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't live in London. They live in another city in the UK. And he, his son actually thought that, there were, uh, that everyone in that city was Muslim. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. And this city must be, who knows, 5 10% Muslim. Yeah. But because of the kid is going to Islamic school, he's mm. got his parents, he's got family, friends, everybody is Muslim. He's like, oh, is everyone not Muslim here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that's kind of, that's that's kind cool, of funny. Man. That's cool. And you can get that as well, you know. I mean, yeah. I, I imagine that's like Birmingham or somewhere like that, right? Where he, where he thought that. Or a town, mm. a small town. Mm. But yeah, mm. I mean, I, I can only talk about London 
and London you get that feeling from time to time but it's definitely not the norm to get that yeah. feeling yeah yeah on the flip side I do think the whole the, the activity among um, Muslims or especially the very committed Muslims in the UK is definitely better than than in the UAE right like there's more going on there's more classes there's more Maybe. events there's more networking opportunities between people who are you know more committed definitely for me that's like a no-brainer like a not no-brainer but it's a it's an absolute fact kind mm. of thing, right? Maybe. I mean, but I, I, you, you can't ahead. point to that and say, that's why the UK is better as a Muslim. Because that's one factor only. So, you, you know, you've got to take all the factors in. Yeah. I mean, there's a few. There's, I, I don't know um, because I haven't lived in Dubai yet, right? And that's that's mm. one thing that I have to... The caveat has got to be there where mm. I'm talking... Part two quite, of this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in a year's time, like... The, <laughs> um, the caveat is that I haven't lived in Dubai yet. I've only been, I've only visited, you know, what, four, I think three or four times. So mm. I can't sit here and say, oh, Dubai is hundreds of better than X, Y, and Z, because I haven't lived it yet. I haven't experienced it yet. So I have to be careful as well. But mm. um, the times I have been there, I've tried to experience this kind of thing as much as possible. Mm. And, um, you know, I did, I did experience again, um, Eid in the park in Dubai, right? We had, as a mm. Kalima event. Um, mm. Those are the guys who brought over. Uh, Abdurrah- Sheikh Abdurrahman, Abdurrahman Hassan and um, Tim H- Ustad Tim Humble uh, and mm. others, right? Um, so they have events very regularly. I know there's other, I know there's other um, organizations that have events very regularly. Mm. Um, so it, I, know, I know it exists. I don't know if it's as active as the London scene, but mm. um, it seems to be going in a direction where it's going to get more active. I don't know if it's going to match London. I'll, I'll see, I suppose, when I get out there and see how much stuff there is mm. going on. Uh, but at least there's something. There is something there, and um, yeah, there is. Like, yeah. And like I said, mixed with the fact that you get that Islamic feel from the society and just living there in general, yes. yeah. I think it makes up for it a, a little bit at least. Yeah, yeah. I think a big factor, uh, like what shapes society here, is the fact that most people are not here to stay, right? Yeah. Whereas in the UK, maybe the first generation were not sure if they were going to stay, mm-hmm. but pretty much everyone else after that is like, okay, we're staying here. Mm-hmm. And when you have that mentality, of course, you're more willing to be to donate to your masjid every week for years, yeah, right? Yeah. Because of that reason, right? So I think that affects things here a lot. Like, uh, I don't know, for example, a friend of mine struggled to make friends in some of these Islamic events here because like no one really is there to like make friends and stuff they're just like trying to feel closer to Allah and and work make some extra money and kind of go home in a few years so that's something but uh, I think it would be good to do a like a year later kind of debrief of what you found life to be like and stuff yeah really good yeah absolutely Um, let me see what else I had oh yeah uh, um Echi Tweet had a question for you. I asked him, okay. is there anything you want me to ask uh, in, on your behalf? He said, "He said I want to know more about his work journey and the effects on family when mm. moving abroad. Okay. Kind of broad, but I'll, okay. Um, um, my work journey. Okay, so let me quickly um, summarize this. So, um, where should I start? I can start from university, really. The fact that when I finished my A-levels... Um, mm. like with most um, kids around that age there's a lot of pressure to go to university mm. and uh, I always kind of knew I wanted to be a business owner and work for myself even then but I didn't know what that looked like I didn't know how that would come about I didn't know what industry all that kind of stuff mm. uh, and I was always very creative in school so I used to be good at art and that kind of thing so I thought okay there's big pressure on me to go to university I think I think university is the right choice because everyone seems to say it is uh, what and I'm creative so what can I do that's creative that can get me to university, that can get me some sort of good paying job at the end of it, and that can then I can launch a business in that industry and, and live like that. That was my sort of mm. thinking at about 18. Yeah. So I used to think, okay, well, fine art degrees and like art degrees are not very good because you know nobody sort of employs people that with a fine art degree usually. So I thought yeah. the, the, best, the best kind of job, the best paying kind of job I can get that's creative is architecture. Mm. So um, I went to I went to study architecture for, and architecture is a seven year course by the way. So it's it's like becoming a, yeah it's like becoming a doctor. Yeah. After about three months, I said yeah this is not for me. I went to study this is not for me. I didn't like architecture itself. I didn't like the um, didn't like um, my university. I, I didn't like the I, I really disliked education anyway. The institutionalized education, even at school. Mm. So I thought this is just like a, a seven year extension of it, and I just 
I was thinking, man, I've, I've had enough of it to be honest. So mm. I dropped out of uni of university after about three, I think three and a half months. Mm. And um, at that point, I was planning to go, and uh, I launched I launched a little a tiny little business at that time, but I wasn't expecting it to, to take off, and it didn't. Um, and then I worked for my dad for a little bit. I worked for my dad for about a year and a half, um, and he had a company uh, based in North London that was like providing care and support to um, juveniles, basically. Uh, so I was mm -hmm. working in the head office there. Uh, at the same time, I was looking for ways now to to start my own business or start making money by myself and, and, and doing that kind of thing. So I started freelance writing and blogging for, for different mm -hmm. companies. And pretty quickly, I, I, I sort of fell into the software space, the software niche. And mm -hmm. I started writing for um, just different software companies uh, and the publications. I was writing for Shopify quite early on. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I started working for a company called CMS Critic, which is... Um, okay. That's a publication, basically, that sort of covered the CMS industry, content management systems. I won't get too deep into that. It's a type of software. But those are the guys that I, I, it allowed me to travel Europe a little bit, attending different events. Mm. So I was with them for about three to four years. Uh, and then about three years ago, um, yeah, three years ago, wow, um, <laughs> I left them and started working with uh, another similar company called CMS Wire. And at the same time, I launched my company finally, which was... Um, uh, it's called Wordify, and we do content marketing uh, for software companies. So we work with software companies to help them produce blog posts and um, website copy and this kind of stuff. So that was three years ago, and we're still going, alhamdulillah, and um, inshallah going to be going for very, very many years or until I die, inshallah. Um, so that's pretty much my work journey. Um, mm. Yeah, as far as how it, is, how it affected family, it's a good question. Um... I don't know how it affected my family. I mean, I got married at a, around the same time I launched my business, so it was a kind of <laughs> it was kind of a slow burner in, in the sense that I didn't have like huge amount of projects like in that first first like oh, six right. months to a year, right? So mm. it wasn't it wasn't like it all came at me came at me at once. I had a steady amount of work, alhamdulillah, but it wasn't like life changing amount where I was like having to neglect my family or anything like that. And mm. um, you know, it just it comes to a stage where you just got to be. And this is something you and me talk about as well offline. I mean, like mm. managing time, mm. managing responsibilities, this kind of thing. It's a, it's a constant struggle. And um, as far as how my family have been, have been affected, inshallah, they haven't been affected too much. Inshallah, I've been, you know, um, I've, I've been giving them their, their rights in that sense. But um, yeah, I mean, what do you think? What do you think he meant specifically by how it affected? Well, your he, family? he said uh, about the family part. I said, I think he said affected by moving abroad. Oh, okay, that makes more sense then. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. My parents, um, they're not, they're not exactly in favour of it. Um, however, very interestingly, they said this to me about a year ago when it sort of started becoming more concrete. Uh, they said to me, our parents left Cyprus because. Um, you know, society wasn't right there. There was, there was, you know, a war was going on almost, and mm. um, they came here for a better life. They came here for a better society, better economy, all that kind of good stuff. And so they said to me, "I, we can't then now stop you because you want to do the same thing. You're seeing this society go a certain way, and you're seeing another opportunity somewhere else in the world, and you want to move there to, to take advantage of that. And mm. um, we can't, we don't want to stop you from doing that kind of thing. So even though they, even though they are." They would rather that I stayed. Um, yeah. They they can see that they can see the benefits. They can see why I'm doing this. They can see that it's more in line with how I want to live my life and how I want my family to be raised. And they can they they also appreciate very much so that uh, society in London is not mm. the same as it was yeah. 30 years ago or even 10 yeah. years ago. They know that you know. So they they can't they don't really argue against my my points. They just sort of are, are sad. And so mm. am I. It is sad. Um, and the same for mm. my. My in-laws, um, they're a bit more against it. Um, mm. uh, they're a bit less understanding, but again, they are at the end of the day, they do understand and you know, they mm. have accepted it. So mm. it has been difficult and it is gonna be difficult. And you know, when it, does, when it, when it comes to crunch time, um, it'll be hard. There'll probably be you know, tears shed and you know, people be very upset. And when we move and we do finally sort of spend our first week and first month out there, inshallah, going to be hard mm. for us you know like i said previously it's going to be hard for just not, not to have your family that close by that accessible um and yeah there's there's no real easy way around it man you just got you just got to weigh up the pros and the cons 
and say to yourself, yes, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be a hard transition, but eventually you, you'll probably get used to it, uh, everyone will get used to it, and the, the benefits, inshallah, will be, will be across generations, not just like a year or two, it's going to, be, it's going to impact uh, my children, inshallah, their lives, right, or my life in, in the future yeah. as well, in a positive way, inshallah. Yeah. So that's how, that's how I'm looking at it, the, the long-term benefits over the short-term pain, mm. really, the short-term sadness, because it is sad mm. that, you know, for many months out of the year, I may not see my, my parents and my family. So mm. it's tough, it's tough, but yeah, you've got to weigh up the pros and the cons and, and take it from there. Need that villa. <laughs> yeah, bro. we need that villa, bro, that's uh, yeah. essential. Now, I wanted to ask you, because you're saying it's multi-generational, how, mm. you know, how do you plan to make that happen considering there is no permanent residence for the UAE? Obviously you can't get citizenship, so. Yeah. How, will, how are you planning to deal with that? It's, um, it is changing. There's change on the horizon. I don't know if you've spoken about this offline, but there is there are like retirement um, visas coming without sort of going too deep into this because it, it hasn't been announced officially, I don't think yet. But oh, there are, you got the insider information, yeah? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um, no, I think it's like common knowledge that it's coming, but they haven't sort of uh, formulated it yet. Where it's sort of okay. like if you have a certain amount of savings or you've got a property of a certain amount, uh, yeah. that it uh, costs a certain amount you can get um, it's going to be called like a retirement visa or something like this where you can actually just mm. retire right mm. so there is that there is that element um, and yeah inshallah I mean obviously Allah knows best Allah's the best of planners if it's going to be if I'll be able to retire there and you know die there and have my mm. kid have my kids continue living there I don't know I don't know um, Allah mm. knows best um, so you're but, kind of still seeing how things will go on that side of it yeah, man, I can't, listen, like I said before, I haven't, I haven't lived there yet, so I can't sort of put a line yeah. under it and say, yeah, man, Dubai is it, and I'll never leave, and it's the best place, and, you know, mm. it may not work out like that way, or it may not work yeah. out that way in 20 years' time, you know, we may have to move mm. again, and if that's the case, then, you know, alhamdulillah, it's going to have to be the case, but for now, I think today mm. and the, the next, you know, 10, 20 years, inshallah, I think it's the, the right place to be, mm. um, and if it doesn't work out to be a multi-generational move, then um, inshallah, the, the next place we go to or come back to is um, is suitable. And um, mm. at least yeah. you would have tried and like taken that plunge, yeah, uh, um, rather yeah. than just staying where you are and kind of shutting your eyes and hoping things improve. Perhaps that's right. That's right. Um, you know, I'm always you know wondering about this because, like. Like I obviously I already live here and I'm just thinking about this whole thing of community and people, you know, being among people and knowing people who are committed and investing and staying in, in whatever place uh, I'm in, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's a big thing that I think about quite a lot and I talk about with, I mean, all my friends, like all my friends are people who they don't have this thing of yes i live here i'm from here and that's it like i'm gonna live here die here my kids are gonna live here die here like pretty much all my friends are people who are like yeah in five years i don't really know where i'm gonna be you mm. know so uh it, it's a big it's a big uh thing and i think but i think what you're doing is probably the right way which is i don't know where i'll be in five years like i don't know if this is going to work out but let me go let me do one two three years and i can always go back i can always find somewhere else but yeah. if i never attempt it then i can't know if it's the right move etc you know yeah bro that's that's and that's pretty much what we can do you know i mean we can only plan to a certain extent you know allah's the best of plans as i said and everything is written you know what you can mm. do is is way up where i am right now is it the best place for me to be is it the best place for more, my family my children to be if you can say yes to that confidently, then fine, man. You go mm. ahead and, and do that, and, and that's you know your decision. If there's if there's mm. some way that you can change that environment and go somewhere that is just safer to be on, on all in all aspects, crime wise, Islam wise, you know everything wise. If it's safer to go somewhere else, you know you don't have to know that you're going to be there for 50 years. You don't have to know that all your generation will, will be there. I could walk out of, of of where I am right now and get hit by a bus and never even get to Dubai. You know. So mm. there's no point of really thinking that far ahead on, on where where will I be in five years' time. All you can do is make your mm. make your decisions, tie your camel, and um, yeah, you just you just after that you just go with the flow and, and you react to um, whatever is whatever you know Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala you know puts in your path kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I, I think we'll wrap up after this last question mm -hmm. because I think 
like we said, one of the main barriers for people moving is a uh, job and a family, right? Yeah. So when it comes to job, like obviously you have a business, you can very, I'm sure very happily, you can pack up your business in the UK and move over here where you're going to pay zero tax, right? Mm -hmm. But what if you had a job like, what how would would you still be thinking the same way you think now in terms of li living somewhere else moving uh what do you think you'd be thinking yeah i would i mean if i had a job and i got the and i got a job offer from you know dubai or abu dhabi or kuwait or wherever you know mm. i would i would do the same thing i would go you know based on that job based on whatever that salary was um and i would go there and again mm. just you know, have tawakkul rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you would be in the it. UK applying for jobs like elsewhere in yeah. order to move, basically. Yeah, I, I would be. I would be. And mm. um, in fact, even when we were first getting married, um, my wife, who is a teacher, that's what we were doing. Like, because the teaching job in Dubai or in the Gulf is like a lucrative one, right? Um, yeah. So we were, we were applying for teaching jobs, you know? So this was, this is when my business was just about starting. So I didn't have, really have a business. So we were doing that. And um, mm. we were looking to make that happen. So, mm. yeah, I mean, I th like I said, I think anybody who's got the opportunity to apply for jobs, it doesn't have to be in the Gulf either. You know, if you want to move to Turkey, go ahead. It's, 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 it's a lot better than than uh, living in, in the West, really. Mm. Or Malaysia or wherever you want to move to, you know, there's, yeah. there's options out there. Because, mm. I don't know, I mean, I look, I look around me and I just don't feel confident that in 10, 20 years time, this is going to be an accommodating place for muslims and a, 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 a helpful place for muslims to be will there be mm. muslims here yeah of course there will be you know like i said alhamdulillah i've got all the masajid here got lots of stuff going on but is it the healthiest place to be on earth i don't know if mm. i don't know if you can answer that you know honestly by saying yes really mm. yeah good point uh, i always i even think like if you were serious like really serious about moving elsewhere even if you were going to live like you're thinking, look, I, I can live in Pakistan, yeah? I can mm. hack it. I could even enjoy it. I've got family there, this, 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 yeah? yeah. The only problem is, in Pakistan, the salaries are not good. You're not yeah. going to live okay, right? If I was that person and mm. I was living in the UK, I would be learning some kind of skill that would allow me to make a living independent of location. Yeah. So Just for the purpose of being able to live in Pakistan. Like, that's... If you really want it, like, I think you would do something like that, wouldn't you? So, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. That's um, that's obviously one very not easy way, but that's one definitely one way to to sort of live wherever you want to live, right? If you have a, yeah. a location agnostic job, which mm. means you can work from online, then yeah, you can go and live. You can go live like a different country every month if you wanted to, or you can set down roots in your home country or wherever. So that's yeah. that's definitely one way of doing it outside of you know just having a conventional business and having yeah. a job. You know, it's another way of doing it. Uh, where you mm. make you make your business like a uh, location independent or location agnostic and you mm. can go and do that and um mm. yeah but th that's another reason why for me personally the golf is a good location because you know when you have a business you want it to be positioned in the world where it's like in a relatively respectable position business-wise right so i could have gone and lived mm. in cyprus for example like that's mm. that's what it's not the most islamic society either don't get me wrong but um you know that was off the list because you know, you want you want to be positioned in a place where you could potentially meet clients, you could potentially set up meetings with clients, you can when you send your invoices off, you've actually got like a, a location that sort of makes sense business wise and not just like a a mm. random village in Cyprus. So yeah. um all these kind of things they, they play a role. But um the main thing that we should be thinking about is, you know, for our for our sake, for our children's sake, is this place gonna help them, you know, re remain upon Islam basically. Mm. That's and that's um it's a scary question. You've got to think about whether where you are right now is the best place for that. Mm. Yeah. Okay, last question, I promise. Yeah, I can actually... <laughs> I don't mind. I don't mind. Okay, cool. in that case. Uh, so I've got to kind of shift. But what is one, two or three things that you think are going... You're going to have to basically take a hit. You're going to lose out on by moving mm. here. Obviously, put, put aside like parents and family and stuff. What what do you think you're, you're like admitting to yourself? Look, I'm just gonna have to let go of it. Uh, low low sweet potato prices. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> uh, so, uh, for those who are unaware, uh, me and Amin had a quick conversation a couple of days ago um, of him proving that sweet potato or, or a few few different vegetables are far more expensive in the UAE than they are in the UK, and sweet potatoes are one of them. <laughs> so sweet, I've got to give our sweet potatoes based on the pricing that you showed me. <laughs> um, other than that, bro. 
the main thing for me that only the only thing that plays on my mind is the family thing the fact that i won't be spending that much time with my family you know mm. i visit them every week now i can't do that that's the only thing mm. honestly other than that and again i know it's not some sort of utopia some sort of paradise and I, and I know when i get there i'll find things right i'll find oh man it's not the same as london london mm. had this better i'll find i'm sure i'm sure i'll find things like that but yeah. right now I don't really see what I'll be missing out on, to be honest. There's, there's, if anything, mm. there's more things to do and live and experience there than there is here. So, uh, yeah, man. Other than, I don't know, extra rain. Other than that, I can't really, can't really put my finger on, you know, family is the main thing. Other than that, I can't really, mm. nothing really plays on my mind that I'll be missing out on, to be honest, but I'm sure that will change. Hmm. Okay. I guess we'll find out later, mm. inshallah. Do you have any? Uh, one thing, go ahead. one thing you'll, you'll, I think uh, have an issue with is uh, four pound coffees. <laughs> yeah, that's so, true. That's true. Yeah. coffee is more expensive in in UAE, but yeah. uh, I'm planning to get. What is and it then, called? and then, if you want, bro, if you need the coconut milk as well, then damn, <laughs> yeah. we're talking five pound now. <laughs> yeah, bro, that that is true. That the, the coffee will be more expensive, uh, even though London's now gone up to like three pound for a coffee as well. So it's not a huge really? amount off. But um, mm. I'm planning to get an espresso machine, so that might help. Okay. I don't know if the espresso the the pods are, are more expensive mm. as well, but that might help. So I'll make my mm. own coffee at home, inshallah. Inshallah. Okay, bro. Jazakallah khairan for joining me on Mind Heist episode 49. We had a few questions come in on the Curious Cat, but I'm going to have to rush to Salah. No Hopefully, worries. you'll deal with them in the next episode. Um, uh, of course, you can go to mindheistpodcast.com now and you can find uh, the link for the Curious Cat, the email to contact us at and i think the link for instagram so it's all there on one simple page um and yeah see you next uh, week inshallah um and thanks uh, kaya again for uh joining me anything you want to drop any links or anything before we end no i don't think i'm, I'm looking to i feel want to if we want to reach out to me and ask about anything that i've spoken about they can i think probably instagram is probably the best place and um my instagram is at kaya k-a-y-a Ismail, I S M A I L. It's just one no word. space. No between. space. Yeah. No space. Mm. No space. Okay. Jazakallah khairan. Barakallah. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah.